Good afternoon. My name is Alan McCoy. I am Director of Startup Support at the University of Maryland's UM Ventures. I would like to welcome all of you to our today's installment of Startup Fundamentals uh, workshop series. Uh, today's speaker is a well-known and very experienced and successful entrepreneur, investor, and startup mentor, uh, Tim Jones. Thank you so much, Tim, for taking the time for us and sharing your wisdom. I understand that you have worked with a lot of startups um, and if, especially the academic startups. So you have a lot of experience um, mentoring them and um, have a lot to share with us and especially on the leadership. So we're looking forward to your session. I'm uh, gonna go ahead and stop my video, mute my mic and give the mic to you. Again, thank you so much for your time. And thanks, Al, I appreciate it. And everyone, I appreciate the opportunity to, to share with you a little bit of my story and, and my perspective. I will say, uh, uh, it's, uh, I like to say I'm not that smart, but I've made every mistake in the book. So what I'm trying to do today is, is share with you some of the mistakes I've made and what I've learned from it. So first of all, uh, let me share with you my screen. And um, this is a kind of a, more of a, a, a approach that I wanted to take a, talking about specifically around leadership of a university-based startup. Um, and the question at hand is whether or not as the founder of a university-based startup, you know, something that's either technology that's being commercialized or, um, or a project that could be turned into a, a product. There's one big operative question is just really, you know, do you want to, do you want to lead this thing? Do you want to be the CEO of the, of the startup longer term? So the kind of the tongue in cheek question is, do you want to be CEO or CEO? No? And uh, I'll get into a little bit more of the detail of what that, uh, what actually entails of, of that, that decision process. Um, so let me go ahead here. Um, yeah, and I would say the, you know, the, the operative question, again, the title of, of this webinar is really is, you know, when you look at being a founder, when you look at startups, is being the startup CEO the right role for you as one of the principal founders or, or stakeholders in, in the organization? I should also mention, um, we're going to have a Q&A period at the end, so I'm going to kind of go through and give you a bit of uh, the, the perspective I have in my story, and then we can go through uh, all of your questions as, as they come in. So there's a, there's a piece of research, a piece of uh, literature out there about 10 or odd years old, um, which is basically a, a series of white papers on this founder's dilemma, which is basically, is it better to be rich or is it better to be king? And the thesis here is, is it better to be a, a participant in a startup or is it better to focus on being the leader, being the king? And there's actually been a considerable amount of research comparing the outcomes of founders when they are when they choose to just to be part of the pool of, of startup founders versus the founders that say, no, I'm only going to do this if I get to be the CEO, if I get to own a majority of the company, and then comparing side by side after a period of time what the outcomes actually look like. And so this is the quote unquote, the founder's dilemma, uh, you know, which of these paths do you actually take? Um, uh, a little bit uh, on my background. So um, uh, originally from, from uh, Berkeley, California, I mentioned that because I kind of grew up in the ecosystem of a university, UC Berkeley. Um, I, I joked that the first job I had where I wasn't cutting lawns was actually as an, as an intern building uh, programmable controllers at the 88 inch cyclotron. So um, not your standard like you know high school job, uh, but that's also where I think I, uh, you know, I developed a love of university-based environments and university-based startups and a deep you know a, a passion and appreciation for creating companies and products out of, out of research so um along the way so uh did my undergraduate work at mit came out went back to the west coast after that started at uh started at, at, at uh, oracle corporation was my first job actually interviewed with larry ellison and i have jokes about the various larry ellison stories that i will someday write in my own tell-all book but uh, you know, along the way, I've been uh, a participant in, in seven plus startups as, a, as an individual contributor or a founder. You know, three times was actually a founding CEO. Two of those were university affiliated, one from MIT, one from Georgia Tech. Um, I, as an early employee and individual contributor, have actually run the gamut from startup all the way through IPO. So I've kind of seen what that, um, what that journey is like. And it's, um, it, there, are the, there are very specific behaviors I've seen of companies that ultimately end up going public and there are pluses and minuses of going public that we can talk about. 
Um, I've spent a few years on the venture side as a card carrying venture capitalist, specifically working on university commercialization. Um, it, at kind of at the peak of the internet bubble, I helped launch uh, the East Coast office of a Silicon Valley firm where we were basically uh, trying to work with professors and technology licensing offices for every university east of Reno, Nevada to identify intellectual property which could be commercialized, try to uh, figure out how could the, the founding uh, PIs you know, build a team, get them funded, get them launched, et cetera, which also included spent stints uh, as a, you know, as an SBIR uh, 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 grant evaluator associated with those sorts of companies. Um, I've also spent over 20 years as a limited partner in a few venture firms, um, which has given me a, a different sort of perspective on the, uh, the financing and the, the startup process. So having seen it, not as, a, as someone building the company, but seen it through the investing phase, but also from the perspective of a limited partner, it's actually putting money into venture firms for the purpose of investing. So I, I've looked at at least a thousand deals. That's probably a, an understatement of the number of, of individual companies you know, I, I've looked at. And I, the reason I mentioned that is I do think that there are some lessons you learn along the way. There are patterns you begin to actually see when you look at, uh, look at different companies and you actually look at the outcome. So without further ado, um, the average tenure of a founding CEO is around 18 months. And um, going back to that rich versus king question, that founder's dilemma. And I, I think when people think about doing a startup and think about being the founding CEO, I think there, there's very often a tendency to latch on to examples of CEOs that have been in place for very long periods of time. So we think about the, the Larry Ellison's of the world, for example, who, who essentially have been in, in, in the seat for 40 years. Uh, you know, we think about, uh, you know, the Steve Jobs of the world, you know, the, the CEOs have long tenures, you know, maybe go away, but still come back and they're still the CEO. In reality, when you look at the vast number of companies that are founded venture back companies, it's about 18 months between the, when the, the founding CEO either elects to leave or is asked to leave by outside investors or board members. And there are a number of reasons for that, um, but I wanted to kind of give a, a visual of essentially what the job is like of being a founding CEO. I, I refer to it as you're perpetually staring, you're on the, 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 the uh, you're walking the plank and you're perpetually staring over into the abyss. And every day you feel as if it's essentially your last day because of some um, new requirement or some complexity, which you weren't able to anticipate, but is ultimately your responsibility as CEO to deal with. And um, this is in essence, the job, that sense of tension of, of every day. And that's also one of the reasons why the average tenure of a CEO, of a founding CEO is relatively short is that whether it be as a result of circumstances, people move on or just simply exhaustion because of the, the kind of the challenges and the stress associated with being the CEO in that really, really early stage of the company, it's a relatively short you know, uh, period in office. Why this is also important is that, uh, again, um, I think there's a misconception that the amount of time it actually takes to get to uh, a period of stability and eventual liquidity in a startup is a four-year, five-year window in reality, it's around seven years before you kind of know whether or not the, the company is going to be stable or not, and it tends to be around 10 years before you actually get to a liquidity point. So you can see if you're the founding CEO, the probability that you actually hang in there and that you actually end up being the CEO when either you sign the, the mergers and acquisitions documents or you're ringing the bell on Wall Street, that probability is actually pretty low. Um, so first and foremost, one of the reasons, in addition to the, the, the quote unquote stresses of day-to-day -day life, um, one of the, the issues that the founding CEO has to address is that there is really no initial product market fit. And this is even for companies that go through the, the i process. What i does is it actually, um, in many ways, it reduces a lot of the, the low-hanging risk. It reduces a lot of the, the variables that are very obvious. But at the end of the day, in the words of Napoleon Bonaparte, no plan survives contact with the enemy. So even when you go through i even when you graduate, even when you have your, your business model canvas figured out, you've done your customer development work, when you actually go into the market to actually try to build the product and the company, because those are two different uh, building activities, uh, you find that essentially there, there's, you're going to come up short. One of the areas where you come up short very often is that there's insufficient funding 
to actually execute those multiple pivots that we hear about during the process of customer development and uh, the business model canvas creation. So there's always this, this, um, this mantra that you go out, you talk to prospective customers, you basically see if you get product market fit, and then you know what you're going to go build. Well, when you're actually out building it, what you will find is that if you, you very often you will have people nodding their heads saying yes for what appear to be all the right reasons, but you find that ultimately that pathway isn't the, cor the correct pathway for building the company, which means that you have to pivot. And that pivot actually takes capital and takes time. The two resources that as a founding CEO, you're constantly paranoid about. So one of the biggest issues that you that we end up seeing is this underestimation of the time and the money that's required to execute these multiple pivots and to get repeatable sales and repeatable product outcomes. Now I want to uh, drill in just a little bit on what I mean by repeatability. Uh, it's one thing to get a handful of disparate customers to buy the product, buy the story, invest in the company. But actually in order to make a company scalable, and particularly if you want it to be scalable with venture capital as the source of, of the capital, the sales and the product outcomes have to be repeatable. Essentially, you have to sell the exact same thing to the same cohort of people who buy it for the same reason and end up having the same product outcomes. And that's surprisingly difficult. Um, I have had multiple instances, both myself as an entrepreneur and, and as an investor, where the, the company has done the right things. It's gone off, it's basically built a product, it's found people who are interested, they buy it, but the, the customer base doesn't look the same. They're in different vertical industries, they're using the, the technology for different uses, uh, uses in different uh, uh, parts of the organization. So there's no pattern recognition, there's no consistent signal. So one of the key challenges of the startup CEO, the founding CEO is getting that repeatability. Um, having people say, I buy it to do this, and it, it solves this problem this way, because that repeatability is what you need as a story, both to raise successive rounds of capital, but also to actually get other customers on board. And that's, that's just a challenge. That is one of these things that is very hard to do at the beginning. And by the time a company gets to liquidity, that's a well-oiled machine. That's what Wall Street wants to see. And as a founding startup CEO, you actually have the job of trying to to, to get that figured out. And that's, that turns out to be relatively difficult. One of the other big issues also uh, I'll raise here is ability and inability to recruit given limited resources. What you find in these earliest stages that you always need talent that you can't bring into the company because of capital constraints, um, relative immaturity of the market or immaturity of the company. So as a startup CEO, and I'll get to the kind of the task list of the job, um, recruiting is one of your biggest challenges, but there is a gap very often in the early stages where you have an inability to actually get the talent you need. You're always one step behind. And so you, the startup CEO, end up filling that gap. I mean, you may physically end up filling that gap with your own body where you're holding multiple hats and um, in a more mature company would be uh, totally different roles in, in the organization. So the general story that you begin to see is, um, you know, the founder comes up with the idea, they go and get some, some angel money, some seed money, they launch, you know, if they're a university founder, they go across the street, get a, you know, an 18 month lease or a one year lease on a sublet on some property, they spend some time building a product, they maybe raise a little bit more money, they launch the company, they get a little bit of success, you know, the proverbial moderate success, the, that handful of customers that nod their heads up and down and say, yes, I want to use this, I want to buy this. And then these realities kick in, this gap begins to show between uh, of the financing necessary to execute the multiple pivots. Um, the, the product gaps begun to begin to show where your customers actually want more from you than the, the product is currently able to provide, which is all of which means that ultimately you're going to need more financing than you initially estimated you would. And when you go back to the market to raise that additional financing, it's very common that that next round of investors will you know, pat the founding CEO on the back and say, you've done a great job getting it this far. We're going to put more money in. But one of the requirements for putting more money in is we're going to bring you know, our person that is a venture partner here in the firm into the organization. They're going to take it from here. You're going to take another non-CEO role, VP of business development. If you've got a sales background, maybe you become a, a, a VP of engineering or a CTO or, or you get bumped to chairman in certain circumstances, but that becomes a requirement of the next round of funding. And in reality, that pattern kind of rinse and repeat, rinses and repeats through multiple round, rounds of financing until product market fit is absolutely certain 
um, absolutely uh, recognizable as a pattern and the, the execution risk is relatively low. So very often you'll find founders that get pushed out and they think, well, you know, it's personal. In reality, it's not personal, it's business. And this is very often the, the, the pattern that, that we actually see. So that's kind of one you know, kind of train of thought, which is just the, the, the dynamics of being a, a founding CEO uh, or being the CEO at founding are such that um, it's just difficult to kind of beat that pattern, that rinse and repeat pattern that 18 month window uh, pattern. Now, another thread I want to talk about is, you know, I think there's an image very often of, of being a startup CEO that is, is not necessarily accurate. So I like to say, in essence, the job is very much overrated. So when we all, you know, you know and I, I did this myself, you know, when, you, when I launched my first company, you think that, you know, being a startup CEO is you gather your core team in a room, everyone's got, you know, Macintoshes on the beautiful table in the great office space. And you, as the CEO, you get to go to the whiteboard and you need to talk about strategy and, you know, big topics and, you know, everything is, you know, really, really, you know, up in the stratosphere thinking. In reality, the job of being startup CEO is you are you are at the top of the giant pile of manure, and you have to to rake it into shape and into form. And every bad possible job in the organization is actually your job. So I have done everything from park cars to you know fix electricity to you know uh, you know fixing an elevator um, to working on plumbing as a CEO. These are all things that as a startup CEO ultimately end up being your job because you need to have your key members of your team doing other things. So uh, I, I chuckle when, um, you know, I, I think very often people, are, are, they're very much uh, attached to the, uh, the elegant visual of, of the job, when in fact, in many ways, it could be the grungiest job you could, you could actually ever have. And in fact, the job is not exactly what, um, separate from the image, it, it's, there's some things that you end up having to do that are either not your core competence or uh, end up being excruciatingly important, but not really interesting, but yet you still got to do it anyway. First and foremost is fundraising. Number one job, uh, number one responsibility of the CEO is not run out of cash. And I separate revenue from cash. There, there are founders who go off and get a lot of sales and they are selling lots of product at relatively small price points per unit, but the companies end up running out of cash. So that's, that's job number one. In the early stages of the company, the first couple of years, very often the CEO is actually the head of sales and responsible for customer acquisition um, because the CEO, the startup CEO is the one who has the vision, understands the story. And in essence, no deal gets done when you're actually going to market and trying to sell a product without the CEO being in the room. So even if, if you hire a VP of sales, you'll find very often a VP of sales or director of sales, whatever it may be, every meeting requires the CEO to be in it because the customers want to hear that vision. So in essence, you're actually running sales. You're also, also trying to figure out the customer acquisition strategy. How do we actually get customers to come to the website or, or to, to have uh, awareness of the company? That ends up being the CEO's job long before there's a VP of marketing, long before there's a, um, any type of sales acquisition uh, talent, the CEO will be responsible for that. And then yet again, you're back out on the road fundraising. Fundraising is a continuous process that uh, I think we are led to believe it is something where you do it once, you come back in a few years, you do it again, and it all magically happens. On average, a venture round takes about four and a half to five months to close, assuming you go down the, the venture path. And um, again, the CEO has to lead the fundraising, which means when the CEO is out fundraising, all of the other things that need to be done inside the organization aren't actually being done. So this, this issue of having to time slice and having to basically be multiple people and have multiple hats is, a, um, is one of the fundamental challenges of, of the startup CEO. Recruiting is another one of the big challenges. Again, much like customers need to hear the vision come from the CEO, prospective hires, particularly the hires that you need to close that talent gap that I alluded to earlier, they want to hear it from the horse's mouth. They want to hear it from the, the, the technical founder or the visionary product founder, but they also want to hear from the CEO. So you've got to interleave in, in the midst of all the operational responsibilities, adequate time to recruit. And you've always got to be recruiting uh, way in advance of potentially even having certain roles open, because uh, particularly in the competitive market, you need to have people identified when you've got the capital to bring them in. You can't get the capital and then go hunt for the people because in, in, a, in the life of a startup, you, 
those months and uh, that it may take to actually find a candidate, that's time that you actually don't have. Um, there's a lot of time that goes into operations and financial management. And by this, it's actually learning the actual operational model for running the company. There's a financial model that you may build in order to raise capital, but that model is actually not the model you're gonna need to actually run the organization. And again, that's a distinction that a lot of uh, founders, uh, startup CEOs don't recognize is essentially that, that beautiful Excel spreadsheet that has a five-year plan with no details might be great to get you an angel check. In reality, you need a 36-month plan um, that lets you know essentially what your working capital is because that's how you're actually going to run day-to-day -day operations. And the, even with a financial professional in the organization early on, it's going to be the startup CEO that has to really understand that model, know it cold, both in terms of decision-making internally, but also in terms of capital raising, being able to represent to investors the actual capital needs of the organization. Uh, HR and, and compensation. Um, believe it or not, you know, um, you know, little things like what are the benefits policies, um, you know, uh, building HR policy, uh, actual HR policies on how you're going to actually treat employees, what the compensation plans are. That actually takes a lot of time. And again, it's one of these things that could be outsourced to a to a to an HR person to formulate. But the CEO is going to actually have to put their their imprint or their DNA particularly around things like HR and compensation. And you see that with some of the most successful companies where, um, uh, you know, I take my, my experience at Oracle, Larry Ellison signed my offer letter. So even when Oracle had, was then a, a publicly traded company, Larry was explicitly making sure he understood everyone's compensation was signing every offer letter. So therefore he could basically put his DNA imprint on people coming in the organization um, and know where people fit. That's the good part of it. The bad part of it is that as an organization grows, you find these choke points where a founder like that basically inhibits the organization's ability to hire because they're actually putting their DNA or putting their signature on every offer letter. So this, this is one of these things that, that takes time. One of the, the last uh, other areas is, is board and investor management. Raising money from investors is one thing, but you've actually got to manage that relationship. And it's a, um, I like to say, it's one of these relationship bank sort of dynamics where you need to invest in that relationship way in advance of needing anything. Meaning as you develop a board of directors, you need to, to, uh, to cultivate your relationship with your board so that your board can do things that you're not able to do. Likewise, your investors who, um, if you are thinking long-term, you want early investors to be able to invest pro rata through the life of the company. So there's a lot of time and care and feeding that goes into investor management and board management, which is again, the CEO's job. And as I said, fundraising, constantly fundraising. You're always, uh, you're always fundraising as a startup CEO. And if that's not something you're comfortable with as a founder, I think it's important to recognize that's a huge part of the job. And that ultimately that's one of those buck stops here sorts of moments where no one else in the organization is going to be held accountable for the ability of the organization to raise capital. So in reality, to quote uh, Mel Brooks in the famous uh, movie History of the World Part One, um, it's actually not good to be the king in many ways. It's, um, it's potentially better to be rich. And let me get into a little bit more of, of, of what rich really means. Um, rich in the sense of a startup means potentially looking at yourself as not the owner or the decision maker of the firm, but being an owner of the firm, which is why I showed kind of the, the group hug shot previously. Um, and as an example of that, there's actually a, a funny inverse correlation between percentage ownership of the company at founding and the actual value, the actual dollar's value at liquidity. And it's a, it's a bit counterintuitive, but the, the thesis being, or um, I think there's a belief system that um, for a lot of founders that you want to own a huge chunk of the company at the beginning. And particularly if you're the founding CEO, you want to have this huge chunk of the company in reality, when you actually look at how companies are valued and what, where companies exit and the actual cash value of the exit, those are inversely correlated. Uh, founders that basically own a smaller percentage end up having a percentage or that amount that they own ends up being worth actually more in absolute terms. Um, there's another interesting caveat, I'm sorry, uh, corollary here is that the earlier the stage and the higher the percentage ownership by the CEO, there's actually the greater risk of that CEO being removed. So, um, and very often some of this has to do with investor dynamics where investors realizing that there will need to be successive uh, waves of CEOs potentially to get the company to success. 
there's almost a bias against a founding CEO that has too much ownership of, of the company. It's also important to realize that there are some almost inviolable, inviolable rules here. When you, again, when you get to the liquidity point of a company where assuming you go down the path of venture financing and with the multiple waves of dilution, roughly 60 to 80%, but very often it's around 80% of the equity is owned by investors, your multiple stages of investors, and 20% is actually held by the insiders. So your VPs end up having, for example, single digit percentages of the company, your founders are 5% to 7% uh, sorts of uh, percentage ownership. So I say this because I, I think very often there's a fixation on, I have to have 50% or 51%. In reality, when you actually look at the cap charts of some of the most successful companies, some of the founders who have, from an economic perspective that ended up benefiting the most have had single digit percentages, maybe 1%, 2% of the company at liquidity versus 50%. And, um, and part of this is that um, to be rich in this sense means you cede operational control to others in exchange for shared ownership. And by bringing, by seeding that operational control and bringing people in that have skills that you don't necessarily have, that you don't wanna take the time to acquire, because the clock is always ticking when you're that startup CEO, you end up building something of greater value. And one of my mentors, uh, founder of a CRM company said to me years ago, uh, the phrase was, it's better to own a slice of a melon than the whole of a grape. And from in economic terms, that, that turns out to be very much uh, the case. So what does rich actually look like? Um, I can't see people's faces, but uh, here is an example of, of, of an entrepreneur who I think uh, is probably one of the most successful and is one of the most understated. Um, so this is uh, Dr. Bob Langer. He's one of the MIT's 15 or so institute professors. And pound for pound, one of the most prolific life sciences entrepreneurs and venture investors. Um, and, and also candidly, one of the most like approachable people. I met with him the first time years ago and he had a windowless office at MIT. You would never pick him out in a crowd, but he has been a stupendous success as a life sciences founder. So he's founded at least 20 odd companies. At the time at which I met with him, um, he actually had an exit rate of, at that time, roughly 30%. So it's, I think right now it's about 25 odd percent. So what it means is that a, a quarter of the companies that he has co-founded or, or founded have either uh, been acquired through acquisition or have gone public. So put in perspective, that is a huge return. That actually makes him a one of the most successful life sciences venture firms at, by himself, given that actual exit rate, much higher exit rate than you actually see out in the, in the wild. He's done all of this while being a tenured professor at MIT and mentioned earlier being one of the MIT's handful of, of institute professors. He's also on the Forbes 400 list, which is something that if you've ever met Dr. Langer, he would not, it's something he would brag about. But without going into the details of that, um, you've got to be pretty high up in the stratosphere in terms of actual economic returns to make the Forbes 400 list, all while still essentially keeping his day job as a, as a tenured professor. Um, and so the, the business model to, to do what Dr. Langer has done is, is as such. What he does through his lab, the Langer lab, is he identifies good science, good technology that has defensible IP. He actually empowers his graduate students and his uh, postdocs to work on the commercialization groundwork. He essentially brings them in as co-founders. Again, this whole thesis of beginning to divide up the pie. If you think of it almost like a, uh, an actual uh, chef in a restaurant, he's essentially the, the sous chef who's basically walking up and down the line and sprinkling knowledge on the go-to-market plan, on the productization plan, excuse me, but allowing the students and the postdocs to actually lead the charge on the commercialization pathway. Then along at some point along the way, he, from his own personal capital, co-invests while bringing in venture capitalists, um, but he still keeps a minority ownership as a co-founder. So he has a percentage of the company. He doesn't own 50% of the company. He has high single digit, maybe low double digit percentage of the company uh, at the earliest stages. But then immediately his model is to find a CEO that has operational background and expertise in all of the, the stuff that you've seen on the previous list, all of the, you know, the HR, the finance, the fundraising. And Dr. Langer then steps back and lets that CEO do their work. And he will, participate and collaborate and he will add value to the company as an expert in the area in which he has unique expertise, but he lets 
you know, that, that other person take, or those other multiple people take those different phases of CEO leadership in the growth of the company. All the while he maintains his economic interest, basically keeps his balance in his life uh, such that you can see that, you know, you saw the smile on his face. Um, so keeps uh, keeps sane. And then he just rinses that model and repeats. So, you know, what I've seen, um, you know, in compared, compared to uh, what I myself personally have done and what I've seen a number of CEOs do, that model is far more sustainable for a university entrepreneur than the entrepreneur who says, ah, here's my idea, I'm the PI, I'm gonna launch it as a company and I'm gonna be the CEO and I'm gonna do all these other jobs that I've never done before, but because it's my technology or my idea, I am therefore the best person qualified to do the financing and the HR and you know operations and all these other sort, sorts of things. I've just seen that that just tends to not work out very well for the founder and the actual economic outcomes for all involved are much lower than the approach that, that Dr. Langer has taken. So a, a couple more slides and then uh, we can go to the Q&A. Um, a couple of kind of key uh, things I've learned uh, you know, along the way. One is um, when we start talking about economic ownership and, and stock, again, I think there's a, a big fixation on um, how much one owns, what percentage one owns. Um, and very often, if you have three founders of a company, the thesis is, oh, we'll just divide the company up by, you know, we'll give each person a third of the company. One lesson learned along the way is that the, the equity should go with the job that needs to be done, not with the person who is initially doing it. So what that means is in the earliest stages, you actually have to build a capitalization table that assumes over the life of the company, you're going to staff a number of different roles. And where I've seen companies be very successful is they've assigned equity percentages to those job titles for people who aren't necessarily in the company yet, but that equity is essentially kind of reserved for them. And all the equity, all the grants, the options that are that are issued vest so that there's a four-year vesting period with a cliff. And again, it's breaking the association of equity ownership from so-and-so as my co-founder to, hey, the CTO of a company in this market that's trying to do this should have this relative percentage ownership of the company. And I think that this association is very valuable for two reasons. One is people themselves don't get emotionally too fixated on how much they own. Number two, it creates room for growth, room for bringing other people into the, the, the economic benefits and rewards of the company. And the best thing actually gives insurance against people actually leaving. So related to that, the other point is you always leave room in the pool, leave room in your capitalization chart, leave room in your stock pool to bring in the people in that crowd, to bring in the, that huddle of people that you're gonna need as a founder to be successful. And that is both, a, a good tactic in terms of retaining talent. It's also a very important tactic in terms of retaining capital. A, an experienced investor will actually look at the capitalization chart and be able to see whether or not, be, essentially be able to see through whether or not the founders realize that they are going to need to recruit and bring in other talent than themselves. And very often that's manifest in the pool construction. So I always say leave room in the pool, leave 25, 30% of the stock pool untouched, um, and assume that 25 to 30% will be untouched for every round of financing until you're pretty far down the path, because that's how you're actually gonna be able to find that great candidate or that great talent that can help the company get to that next level. And that person is gonna you know, have enough ownership of the company for it to be meaningful for, for them. Um, from, a, um, from a mentality standpoint, I like to say that you know, founders, particularly university founders, need to think a little bit more like NFL team owners. So I'm not a big NFL person, but I do know this man. This is Jerry Jones, who owns the, the Dallas Cowboys, who has essentially owned the team through successive coaches, through successive players, um, essentially successive regimes of the league, and he, he's still there. So as a founder, particularly as a university founder, a, tech, uh, a technologist founder, a research-based founder, this mentality of, of essentially uh, putting yourself in the firmament so that you're still there and you're not basically going in and out with the tide of leadership is, again, it's very sustainable. Um, it, it allows you to have a much more of a sane existence and allows you to basically essentially be around for the, for the economic reward. So I like to say, you know, in, in, at the end of the day, you want to think like an NFL team owner, not like a quarterback, and therefore you won't, you know don't go out there trying to get sacked. You know, it's sacked in multiple instances of, of the word by taking on the risk of of, of being the, the startup CEO. So 
Uh, that was it in terms of actual slides. So I'm going to stop sharing and I will turn it back over to you. Ala. Thank you so much. That, uh, that was uh, incredibly um, inspiring and, and incredibly useful for a lot of uh, attendees to hear what you talked about. We do have, so um, I would like to ask everyone to please um, submit your questions uh, using the Q&A function at the bottom, or you can even submit them via chat, whichever you're comfortable with. And the Q&A function has the anonymous uh, submission feature um, if you would like to remain anonymous. So, but we have our first question is, um, thank you for your time and presentation. Yeah. Very helpful. Um, is there a downside risk for the startup success if the founder is the CEO and insists on being the CEO? I'll just say, you know, the, the math shows that the economic outcomes tend to be lower if there's an insistence on being CEO. So th this is why um, I think Rich Wasserman wrote the original paper. You can look it up, Rich versus King. It's a Harvard Business School study that was done roughly 10 years ago, and there have been successive studies around it. But the actual economic returns end up being lower if you insist on being CEO. I will, so there are two elements of this. There's the actual objective, non-deniable data that comes out at the end, at the end of this multi-year period. I think there are cultural and psychic dimensions to this. So from a cultural perspective, it is um, if the founder insists on being CEO, what ends up happening is that a lot of the people who work in the company associate the company only with the founder. And the market begins to associate the company only with that founding CEO. And what happens is that person leaves, burns out, whatever it may be, everything grinds to a halt because the, the, the culture of the company has essentially been evolved to look at that founder as the unquestionable leader and decision maker. And just again, statistically speaking, that founding CEO is not going to be the CEO at the time of liquidity if the company happens to be successful. So if you insist on being founding CEO, essentially you're basically stacking the deck against you, not just in terms of your tenure, but it's putting in place this cultural element where decision making essentially gets um, constrained because there is almost a, a visceral need to refer back to the founder. And we saw this candidly with Apple Computer. So uh, those of you who are old enough to remember when, uh, when uh, Steve Jobs left Apple and John Scully, the, the guy from Pepsi, came on board um, as the CEO uh, of, of Apple. And I was living in the Valley then, and people still perceived Apple as being Steve Jobs' company. And for a number of years, you know, you had a series of CEOs after that. I think uh, Gil Emilio was CEO, not Gil Emilio. There was a series of CEOs, I forget. So name worthy that I've forgotten who they were after John Scully, before Steve Jobs came back. And a lot of it, if you talk to people who worked at Apple at that time, everyone was essentially still waiting for Steve. They wanted to know. So, you know, people who networked with, with Steve Jobs in the, in the, in the Bay Area and in the Palo Alto community, they do something at work and then they bump into Steve Jobs at the Whole Foods in downtown Palo Alto and they bounce off of them. You know, hey, here's what we're doing. And Steve Jobs would weigh in on it. And people were still making their decisions based on what Steve Jobs was thinking, even though he was long gone. Steve was at that time running a company called Next, a, a hardware company. Um, so I, I do think there is a cultural danger of saying or, or too strongly imprinting that DNA of the founder on the CEO job. Now, I think there are ways of doing it where you could say, hey, we're launching this company. Um, I'm going to be the CEO for a while, but my goal is to recruit someone who can do all these other things that I can't do. When that message goes out very early on, it does two things. It sends a message to em employees that there will be change, there will be growth, there will be quote unquote professionals coming in who can help the company scale. But that the founder isn't going to go away. They're, you know, they'll be still, still there. They'll be consultative. They will help the company grow. And by inserting that optionality into the DNA, I think it, it prepares, it future-proofs the company for some of those eventual changes anyway. It's also an extremely positive signal to investors. If a founder walks in and say, hey, it's my idea, it's my IP, I'm going to be the CEO, but I recognize and acknowledge that there are things I don't know how to do so at the point at which I begin to essentially run out of gas, 
I will bring on board another CEO and I want you, the board, to help me in that process. That's an extremely positive signal to a board. And again, I've learned this. The first time I was a CEO, I was that founder CEO who thought I could do it all and it was exhausting. And ultimately I ended up stepping aside for someone we brought in, but it would have been way more helpful for me to have realized going in that that was the messaging I needed to communicate because in that example, my core team still looked to me for decision-making for a long time. And it was a while to get the new person to essentially have the same level of, of trust as I did. So yes, there are statistical outliers. There are the Larry Ellison's of the world that are still kicking after all these years, the Michael Dell's that are still kicking after all these years. Um, but um, those, are, those are outliers. Thank you. We have a few more questions. Um, here's a great one. Um, I totally agree with your perspective. My question is, why does anyone want to be a CEO to do 18 months of hard lifting job if he or she not deeply rooted in IP stocks? Or the other way to put it, how to trick others to be your CEO? This is a brilliant question. So <laughs> I, I think, um, you know, I think, again, I think people want to be CEO because I think we have created a CEO industrial complex in the tech media in particular. It's the tech crunch phenomenon where um, uh, you know, everyone wants to wear the black turtleneck and be Steve Jobs and be on the cover of TechCrunch and be at all the trade shows and whatever. And I will just tell you that's a, again, that's its own exhausting waste of time that has actually nothing to do with actually building the company. So I do think there for um, a good solid 20 years going back in the internet period, there's been this kind of mythology around being a CEO and it's had some very negative circumstances, right? We've had these messianic CEOs who are essentially con artists, <coughs> we work, uh, Theranos, um, who uh, have essentially used that image in order to raise capital, uh, create essentially unsustainable empires. So I, I do think there is the, the media, the tech media plays, it, it is extremely guilty of having created this, this complex. And I think that's part of the reason people want to do it is their perception is, well, if I have an idea, I must want to be CEO. Um, there is very little reinforcement in the media of saying, hey, why don't you just be a founder and, you know, be a founder, be a team of people, take whatever job is the best job for you as part of a founding team, bring on board a CEO and live your life. There's very little attention of that. Instead, we tend to boost the CEOs up, the Elon Musk's of the world. You know, again, people forget Elon Musk did not start Tesla. He acquired Tesla from the two founders um, who, had, who had previously built the company. So we tend to, in the, in the tech media, boost the CEO and, um, I think that's part of the reason why people get into that mode. Now, the question of how do you trick others into being your CEO? I think this is one of these, um, um, in many ways, your first test of salesmanship as a founder is first of all, is having the self-awareness to realize, hey, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be on that giant pile of manure in, you know, six months trying to work through the benefits plan. I need someone else to do that, you know, with me or for me. And in many ways, your first test in salesmanship next to raising capital is identifying people for whom that is actually their core skill. The scaling, the operation stuff, they don't understand the technology, they don't understand the research, et cetera, but they know how to do this other stuff. And there are, there are plenty of people who not only know how to do that well for a, for a, for a technology-based company, but thrive on it. So I, I say that this is a game of both salesmanship and it's also a, it's a dating game thing. This is an, an important point here is that your relationship building, um, it takes you, as I said, seven to nine years to get a company, even a non-frontier tech company, I'm looking at it, one of the other questions, to a point where it's actually, um, uh, you know, kind of sustainable. So it's a long haul. You're going to be, you're going to be in this boat with people for a long time. So you want to take time to get to know the prospective CEO you would bring in, even if there's a recognition, this person may only get you to that next phase line or the next two phase lines. So I, I say it, it is a, it's a game of, it's a, it's an act of salesmanship. I think you can do it in, in total candor, be totally candid that like, you know, hey, I think you can get us from here to here. And at some point it may make sense for us to bring someone else on board and a, the, the, the self-aware CEOs that work with early stage companies, they know where they fit in the ecosystem. They're not necessarily the person to take it from 50 million to 100 million in revenue. They might be the person to take it from zero to 20 million in revenue or 20, zero to 50 million in revenue. So I think this is all about candor and being upfront, but having the self-awareness to realize that 
Um, this is what it generally entails. And those, those cases where the founder is still the CEO 10 years later, that's actually the aberration. That's not the norm. Thank you. Uh, we have more questions. Um, so the next question is, uh, thank you for the talk. I have two questions. One, um, how does this advice change for frontier tech with a timeline of 10 plus years to market, for example, fusion? Um, and then do you want second question right now? Or uh, so the second question is, uh, have you found that PhD graduates can make successful CEOs? Yeah, let's, let's do, um, let's do the second one first. I think statistically, it works out that PhD graduates end up not being successful as CEOs. I think just the numbers, I'm thinking back to my venture days, someone looked, because we were doing a lot of tech commercialization um, deals, I think it turned out that there's a weird sort of bell curve of educational attainment beyond which more education ends up being a detriment to overall company success or company value. And I think it's kind of like after master's degrees, and again, I'm saying in general, not specifically within life science or certain deep tech areas. So kind of like across the board, looking at, you know, at large numbers of data points Ab above master's degrees, there ends up being essentially diminishing value of education in the CEO role, specifically the CEO role. Um, now, it, when we start talking about PhDs for the CTO, chief science officer, oh yeah, absolutely. Again, I take life science, I take frontier technology, I take you know a lot of electrical engineering. Your, you know, that's who's dominating dominating the engineering suite, the the the, the CTO suite. They are people with PhDs, you know, or or masters, but there's probably an equal split between PhDs and masters in, in those senior roles. But I do believe, if I remember correctly from from research I've seen, there's actually kind of this diminishing effect in the CEO role. It's like anything after a master's degree, uh, your essentially your likelihood of being CEO or the actual outcome ends up basically being lower and lower. And again, there's some, there are some, uh, you know, aberrations. There are some 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 unique cases, but that tends to be kind of like the average. Now, with respect to frontier tech, it's a great question. That's actually some of the stuff I've, I've been looking at. I'll give you an example of one company that I spent some time with um, early on, which was Sail Drone, which is a autonomous nautical drone company um, where the um, um, a relatively long timeline for development. So this is you know, basically you think of it, if these are nautical drones that can go for thousands of, of, of nautical miles. And I worked with a founder very early on to basically bring on board a CEO who became CEO so that the founder could actually focus on their work. Now that COO slash who became CEO has subsequently left the company, but the founder's still there. And so that's the point I was trying to get to with the rich versus king thing is that specifically if you're the, the technical research PI leader, your goal is to be there during the life of the company, particularly in frontier tech. It's going to take a while to get to the point where you actually have a viable product, much less a, a market. So the most important thing for you to do is ensure your tenure in the organization. And the best way to ensure your tenure is to not be the CEO. Is to simply say, you know, I'm good at the technology and I understand the IP. I'm going to focus on that. And I'm going to have someone else do a bunch of these other operational things and fundraising things because that's, that may go through successive waves of people as the technology matures and you want to ensure as a PI that you're, you're standing when, when you get to the finish line. So um, I would say it's even more important in the frontier tech space to have this rich versus king internal conversation. And I would say, and that's why I listed Dr. Uh, Dr. Langer as an example, because so many of his companies are life sciences companies with long incubation periods before you either have a therapy or a medical device, he has found that essentially being, you know, not being the CEO on technologies that have long incubation periods, that has been a mo much more successful model. Thank you. Next question is, which role do you prefer personally in your experience? Um, I actually, um, oddly enough, one of the things I, one of the, well, by nature, I'm more of a business development person. So I am a, um, what drives me intellectually is how do I get companies, not so much direct sales, I've done a lot of direct sales, but selling to an end user customer to me isn't as intriguing as getting 
companies, particularly much larger companies, to do a licensing deal or an OEM deal. So the part of me that's that is you know a, a tech person likes to get into the you know what's the OEM go to market product plan, what's the technology, what's a you know product packaging, get into the the technology side of it, and then you also have to put on this other hat of what is the um, the um, the business model around which you would do a a distribution relationship, a channel relationship. So the most fun I've ever had is I did a um, an OEM deal. It was about a forty million dollar OEM deal with Sun Microsystems. It took over two years, two and a half years to do. Um, at one point, I ended up signing a deal in an elevator in Paris. You know, in, a, in kind of a letter of intent. But it was a really like fully comprehensive, using all parts of my brain sort of uh, of thing where I had to be able to spend time with you know, Java engineers, as well as spend time with the people in finance. So that sort of role for me personally is the one that, that I like is that that OEM just um, business development role where you're essentially seeing, can you do one plus one equals three? Can you combine assets of different companies and create something that's much more valuable? Thank you. And we have one more question. Um, if anybody has any additional questions, we still have a few more minutes left. So please feel free to submit them. In the meantime, here's uh, one more question. Uh, great insights. Can you recommend where to get examples or templates for a percentage equity share by position? Yeah. Um, there's a, there's one book that I actually really like. It's a little old, but it, it's got some core principles that I think are really valuable. It's called High Tech Startup. It's by a guy by the name of John Neshem, N-E-S-H-E-I-M. It's a circa... 99, 2000 book. And I think he's done a couple of editions. Um, he's also got another book, a companion book called Engineering Your Startup. So wh what I like about these two books in particular is they take a, again, a very engineering or technologist centric approach to just what are the building blocks of building a company, incorporation, creation of your cap chart, legal, um, and again, in literally engineering your startup, being very methodical about building the company. But one of the things that's also valuable about these books is in the back of, uh, I think, of, of the high-tech startup book, uh, edition, there are a number of sample uh, capitalization charts, which actually show, and these are for kind of circa 90, you know, kind of internet bubble companies. So take it with a grain of salt. I think they've updated it with some web companies. But they basically show you what percentage ownership uh, different people in the company had at seed and series a all the way through to ipo i think it's really valuable for people to look at is to realize particularly if you're going to be raising venture capital at the end of the day you're going to get diluted on average you're going to get diluted 66 odd percent from when you start so um so kind of seeing the path of dilution to the actual end state and then realizing what that value is at that end state I think is really important for people to see, and it helps break this fixation of, I've got to own this 50% of the company. It's very rare that you have large percentages of ownership in any company that ultimately goes public by founders. I mean, there've been some cases, um, you know, in the case of Google, um, Larry and Sergey only raised, they only raised 26 million in a series A, and they never had to raise any more money after that. It was a, a function of when they raised it and they had capital when others didn't. And they were they had such a growth rate they were able to basically become cash flow positive earlier, um, so they were able to hold on to more of the company. Um, and with some of the social media companies, we began to see some very odd behavior in terms of these monster financing rounds where people could then take capital out of the company with each financing round. But the, the, these Nesham books are good because I think they give a much more um, level-headed analysis of what happens with dilution. So that you can actually see essentially um, kind of what the life cycle of a company is. And it goes again to this rich versus king argument. You begin to realize that, aha, the CTO that stays with the company from founding all the way through finish has a nice percentage ownership. And, you know, whereas the people who come and leave don't. So you may be better off being that, C, that CTO that stays with the company through its tenure all the way through to, to IPO. Thank you. And I also just posted a link to a workshop that we did on founders equity formations, illusion and industry averages. Um, so feel free to watch that as well. Um, all right, so next question. Do you anticipate the economy 
um, going down in the next five to 10 years? If so, what is what are the strategies of high tech startups would you advise? Yeah, so um, uh, one of the, the, the things I'm always looking for is essentially um, trying to connect the startup micro life cycle to the macro life cycle, right? Um, so, you know, within your startup, you you have this weird little micro life cycle from founding all the way through to financing, to product, to customers, to revenue, et cetera. But that is not, you can't disconnect that from the macro cycle. The macro cycle really affects you in terms of two things. One, the ability to raise capital um, and the propensity for customers or key partners to engage with the company economically. Um, Personally, we are at the top of a, we're at the top of a literally a triple sigma economic cycle. We have not seen something like this in decades when you look at the overall market. Now there's, you know, geopolitical events are kind of taking a little bit of steam out of the market, but if you actually step back and look at charts over the last 20, 30 years, we're, we're toppy, right? We're at the top. Now, what happens when you're at the top? Um, valuations are insane. That's one of the things we're seeing right now. We're seeing some companies and some sectors raising $30 million, $40 million seed rounds with no revenue. Um, I have a colleague who just raised $110 million for a company with no revenue. Um, uh, on a pretty insane valuation. The issue you get at, the, at parts of the market cycle where we are right now is, first of all, I believe that we are, we're starting to teeter and we're going to go down over the next couple of years. And I do think we'll have some sort of sharp downturn simply because we're, it's cyclical and we're at that part of the cycle. It's extended a lot longer than I thought it would. Um, for a founder right now, two things I think are important. One is essentially having, thinking about the economics, the unit economics of what you're trying to do in rational terms. So not getting sucked upwards into the economics of the bubble in terms of what you think your valuation is and what you think, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the valuation of the company or how much money you could raise, but actually being very pragmatic. And this is why the, the Nesham charts are, might be helpful. Think about the mean case in terms of valuations, not the extreme case in terms of valuations. From a, from a behavior standpoint, this is a time to figure out how to get dry powder, but conserve it. Meaning, um, if you are close to fundraising, the, the, I talked to a number of investors where essentially everyone is advising their companies, if you think you're going to need to raise in the next six months, go raise it right now. If you're able to raise capital, go raise it right now, but marshal it very carefully. You know, sit on it very carefully. It may be that we just have a small dip and then we come back up. Um, or it may be that the, that quote unquote downturn lasts for a year, two years, et cetera. And you, you don't want to run into the situation where you, you are just as you're hitting your milestones in terms of product, you're running out of cash because, um, and that's a tough place to be in where you've done everything you're supposed to do to build your company, but the company is not financeable because you're running out of cash and the market cycle is such that investors, professional investors are just not investing. Um, they'll take meetings, but they're actually not going to invest because they are um, they are concerned about liquidity of their existing portfolio companies. So uh, high level, I believe we are starting to, you know, we're at the top. It's starting to come down. If you're out fundraising right now, my recommendation is to actually raise the capital that you can sit on it. You know, I would not pay attention to what TechCrunch tells you about valuations. I would ignore that because that's the those are the extreme cases that actually get people into trouble because they raise too much money at too high valuations. And in a couple of years time, those valuations aren't gonna be supportable. You've actually seen that some in the public markets where you've seen some great publicly traded companies that are actually growing 25% a year, but, but their stock prices are coming down because the level of expectation that was baked in was too high. The same thing is, it's actually worse in the private market. So, um, don't get sucked into the hype. You know, don't believe the hype in the words of public enemy. <laughs> and don't get sucked in the hype around what valuations really are. Um, and I think it's really important to think about the economics of what you're trying to do. Can you make those economics over time profitable? And what capital does it take for you to get to that point and be conservative about the, the capital spend to get to that point? 
Thank you. I know we are at time, actually one minute over, but I'm wondering if you have time, maybe well, another minute. I get time for one more question. Then I'm actually supposed to be on a call right now, but I'll just take one All right. more. One last thing is, what is the best way to test one's cells in a lower risk environment? Um, if you want to be a CEO. Yeah, work for, work for a well-funded company that has good management where you can learn from people. So I mentioned, you know, um, I've been fortunate to be an early, uh, early employee in two companies that have gone public. For me, the real, so two things. I made economically did better by being an early employee in those two companies than by being a founding CEO. So that was the rich versus king thing. Number two, the ability to learn from people that have done it before and know what they're doing is, is very valuable. So again, don't get sucked into the tech crunch hub of here's the hottest company, uh, first time founder that's raised a ton of money that doesn't know how to build a company. I would argue that you're better off taking a role, an operational role in a company that's being run by someone who's a second, third, fourth time founder who's been around the block because they're going to, you know, all the little nuggets that you saw in my slide deck, those aren't unique. Other people know this stuff. I'm not smarter than anybody else. So the ability to learn firsthand from someone who has seen that pattern before will be much more valuable to you as a CEO when you're a first time CEO. And that those are the people that you actually want to have on your boards of advisors or boards of directors when you actually, if you actually end up raising capital and bringing in uh, outside investors. So that would be my recommendation is go find an operating role in a well-funded company, i.e. not, you know, staring over their shoulder at the tax man or the, the or unable to pay their bills, but where you can learn from a, um, uh, an entrepreneur who's seen these cycles before, because that will be valuable for you as a CEO, being able to, to call on that person as a mentor, but also to learn at their hand about how to, you know, how to get through these, uh, how to handle all those different functions, but also get through this economic cycle. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, this this was fantastic. It's going to be on our must watch list for many of our uh, faculty and PhD student founders. Um, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone with, for your great questions. Um, this video will be posted um, on our Startup UMD YouTube channel. You'll be able to watch it again. And those who couldn't attend live um, will have an opportunity to watch it there. Again, thank you so much, Tim. This has been absolutely fantastic. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.